I'll stand up and uh, hopefully you can hear me. So many smiling faces, uh, one or two not so much. Um, so we'll try and get through this. If there are some questions, I think, Bernie, are we not, uh, we're reserving the questions to the end so that we can go through the full explanation and we'll then take it on from there. So uh, I hope you can see that. I don't know whether the lights might be dimmable just at this end, that would be helpful. And, uh, or in the center, that's great. Uh, so a little bit of history and then a bit of explanation about what you're finding and uh, facing and then uh, perhaps a little bit of understanding of the questions that you might be asking. Um, the first thing is that this was actually a court uh, ordered decision that the Capital Regional District have to treat sewage. You may not be aware of that. That goes back to several battles in court in the uh, uh, mid-2000s. Uh, that result in June 2007 in the path forward uh, which was uh, put together by CRD and it proposed about a 1.2 uh, billion dollar estimated cost for a project which I think about five months later or so on they estimated at 780 million dollars. So that's quite a change from this 1.2 to the 780 million dollars but the thing to bear in mind is that that's the capital cost that's not necessarily the operating cost. So it's a bit like your mortgage but not necessarily how you eat and how you eat usually actually over its life cycle costs more than how you pay your mortgage. You might not realize that, but them's the numbers, and that's the case with sewage as well. So resource recovery was a result of a conversation that happened in, uh, in about 2007, around the time that the path forward was issued, and it was a discussion where I'd suggested that the province might want to get into resource recovery, and that was a sound business case behind it. Um, we then did the study on it, the provincial IRM study, and that then resulted in the province uh, requiring resource recovery. Uh, and in de December 2008, uh, CRD gave the first signs that they would actually be doing resource recovery. Now, interestingly enough, a few people have said that they'd always been doing that. Um, in fact, that's not true. The first signs were an article by Dwayne Kalanchuk in December 2008, and it wasn't in the original report. So this is relatively new in the way in which they were considering business. Um, in the published plan, um, the original uh, direction, including in fact in the uh, rezoning and permit applications to uh, Township of, es of Esquimalt for the waterfront, is still the proposal that they would be putting the biosolids facility out at Heartland Landfill, about 18 kilometers. So um, this sounds like it's crazy until you do some math. Um, so it's about a million dollars a kilometer plus or minus to dig and put the lines up but uh, you've got to add into that the disturbance and the other costs so um, they've just acquired a site and you all know which one it is for 17 million dollars and these two items look as though they're roughly similar until you figure in the operating costs and several other components that go with it so on the face of it they've moved it and um, you're the recipients so either that's a good thing or a bad thing, and I'm sure you've all got your own views, and I hope to illustrate a little bit of that. So in terms of what this is, this is the actual uh, map that was put in, the, in our resource recovery uh, document. It's a simplified diagram. That's the actual document that we published in uh, 2008, although it was started in 2007. And it's important for those people who haven't really understood the issue um, the treatment happens um, at uh, the waterfront, um, but it's actually biosolids that is due to happen around the corner. Um, and so just to simplify this so that you understand what's going on, uh, what that biosolid center is going to receive is sludge, which is processed from the sewage treatment plant that's then pumped in essentially a water-based slurry, about 5% solids, 95% liquids, plus or minus. Uh, they go between 2 and 7%. So roughly that's what they have to do in order to get it to the biosolids plant. And then it's treated there. So what does that treatment look like? And what does it include? Well, it might also include um, wet organic waste. What's wet organic waste here? Anybody have dinner tonight and think about their kitchen garbage? Because that's your wet organic waste. When you peel that cabbage or lettuce or you do anything like that, that's the wet organic waste. Right now, there's, the proposals are that you put it into composting. Uh, that can be challenging. Or you can put it into the uh, anaerobic digester, which is in the biosolids facility. I'm going to show you some pictures of what these look like, so you've got a good idea of what they are. And I'm going to compare the pictures of what they look like in actual life in this province 
with what the diagram is of what they're proposing so that you can see that they are very similar. All right, so this is CRD's own explanation of this and I hope you can tell me what that looks like and how it's explained because um, I find it a little confusing. So let me be basic about this if I can. You've got some sludge that comes in which is kind of a little dark slurry. It's got sewage in it and it's got dead bugs basically. The, anaerobe, the digesters in the sewage treatment plant consume that and they convert it and then they die off and they go into the slurry. So that would get piped up to the biosolids facility where the water needs to be taken out. So you have what's called a dewatering process and it then goes into something called an anaerobic digester. Now they can use other methods but if you think of anaerobic digesters it's very basically as a very large tin in which they have bugs and the bugs eat the sewage and the bugs pass wind and then the wind is methane and then they capture the methane and they upgrade the methane and they do things with it like you do if you've got a natural gas stove or you've got a natural gas fireplace. So essentially that's what that diagram tells you and then as a result of that they have to send the water that they've stripped out of it, they've got to send it back to the sewage treatment plant. So you thought it was one set of pipes coming here, it's not, it's two. One out, one back and they recirculate the sewage. And then what comes out of that also is a residue, more dead bugs. And there's a lot less water in these and then they take them off to another place and that's not going to be in this proposal. That's roughly what happens. So um, the kitchen scraps, I'd just like to deal with that because this is something which has been topical at council here. They've approved to go in with the CRD scheme. Bad news, I'm afraid, Bob. Um, they're only going to achieve about 24% recycling with that. Right? The other 26% uh, uh, total recycling and reuse, 74% uh, will not be done that way. If it had been optimized, it would be 94% landfill avoidance. Right? It hasn't been optimized. So the first thing you need to know is it hasn't yet been optimized. And also, if the biosolids facility is going to receive this uh, wet waste from your kitchen, then it's probably going to arrive in a truck. And don't forget, uh, there are other ways of doing this. So there's composting out in the Saanich Peninsula that's currently going on and in other locations too. The evidence in BC hasn't been too successful with that. A lot of these places go bankrupt, they fail, or they're in the process of doing so. And so the question is, what's going to happen to that then? So it then goes often into the anaerobic digester, and that's the biosolids facility. So today's trucking in this neighborhood won't be tomorrow's trucking, but we don't know how big that difference will be. It could be small or it could be large. In terms of site choice, um, uh, Bernie knows very well because he and I used to work together, but um, I've got a dim and distant past acquiring sites for provincial um, programs. And you do this with a decision matrix. And so you look around for what you've got to do and you, you decide what it is that you need to achieve and you validate it. And that decision matrix, they stated in 2010, is that they were going to make it technically, socially, and environmentally uh, sustainable and, and viable. They were going to rank on that criteria, but that didn't happen. The ranking and the weighting didn't actually adjust for those components, if you go through that document. And part of the reason for that is they found it very difficult to find sites. And so they ended up with the site that you've got. Now, the reason that this is important is because the ranking matrix becomes important if what they're proposing in your community isn't a good choice. And that's essentially what a number of the people in this room are probably saying. This isn't a good choice. So the, the problem is that maybe the matrix didn't work. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into the questions because that's going to flesh out what this looks like. So those pictures up there are what it looks like. So the, um, what you've got essentially is an, a number of bits of plant that process the sludge as it comes in. And then they have, if you see those sort of dome-shaped things, they look like very large donuts with icing on the top. Um, those are uh, where they store the gas, the methane gas. All right. Now, so um, what comes in is a sludge. And as I said, it's treated sewage solids. Right? So it's been treated somewhere else, dead bacteria. And it comes in and it's sealed. Uh, the thing is that in the biosolids facility, they have operations and management, and they also have emergency vents and other things like that. So sometimes they let that gas out, either at different stages of the process, and that creates an odor. Right? So the 
In terms of what the biosolids facility is, it, it dewaters some of this stuff and uh, it processes it. Um, and in terms of how long it takes, uh, sewage in today is going to take around 40 days to process through. So here's a, here's a thing to think about. Can Victoria stop going to the bathroom for 40 days if it goes wrong? No. So they're going to have to store it for 40 days if it goes deeply wrong. The good news is it's fairly rare that they go deeply wrong. Most of the time it's just underperforming. So you build that into your model and, and that's what will happen. So it includes all kinds of things. It may include electricity generation and so on. What will it look like? Well, those are the pictures. Better thing is to look at the pictures. I'm going to show you some more in, on the following screen. Um, it depends on what they decide to put in it, and that hasn't yet been made clear, and look forward to seeing what CRDs say they're going to put in it. So these two diagrams are really good. Um, the one at the top is the actual diagram of what they were proposing at Heartland Landfill. So if you notice the donuts, those are the four items. They look very similar. And then you've got a piece of plant equipment on the right-hand side of it, and that's roughly what it looks like. And so if you imagine it in this community, it looks a little bit like an industrial plant. So probably what you're going to get is an industrial plant. It's going to look a little bit like that. Does it look obnoxious? That depends on whether you like industrial plants, but that's roughly what it's going to look like. And in case you wonder what that really is, that at the bottom is Anasis Island. And you'll notice that it looks very similar. So in terms of what are the normal impacts, well, most of the time these things operate well. They're very well known. They're a totally acceptable solution. But most times they're not put in residential areas. They're put in industrial areas separately to the rest. We'll come on to the reasons why in a minute. There is increased truck traffic. They are visible, but are they that problematic? Well, they can be screened and they can be made to look attractive. There's different treatments that could be used to actually make them look quite good. Um, can you hide them? No, you're probably going to smell them. In terms about the economics, I was asked about the economics of these. Um, as I've said, they can't be optimal. Um, I'm an economist. Uh, this is not likely to be optimal from what I've read. Uh, they may come up with a different solution when they publish this, in which case it may be that they optimize the financials and reduce taxpayer costs. But what I've read so far tells me that that's not the case. Um, in terms of uh, Europe, typically anaerobic digesters are marginal. They're not really that viable. So um, if they go wrong, heavily wrong, and if anybody in this room takes medications, you go to the bathroom, goes into the sewage, comes into the tank, kills the bugs, now it's not optimal. Now they've got failure, and it's either a small amount, or it's suboptimal, or it's a complete failure, in which case it's a little more problematic. Most of the time they just work. But there was a, va a phrase of alley failure. A uh, gentleman with a farm literally bet the farm on anaerobic digesters working, and he lost the farm too. It didn't work. It performed around 16 to 17% efficiency. Nothing he could do could fix that, and he literally lost it. Um, will it affect value, and can it go wrong? These were the last two questions. I thought I'd put those there and then go on to the next screens. So I'll let you read the text there, because that text is really quite important. What it says basically is, um, and that, by the way, is a statement from the, uh, the association uh, for the anaerobic digesters in the UK. And they note uh, 62 accidents, some of them serious, three deaths in Germany, and one death in uh, Britain at the time when they wrote this article. You can search and you'll find a lot more. Um, most of the time, these do not go outside of the site. So if there is a catastrophic failure, which is what that documents, it's rare that it goes beyond the site boundaries. Um, but you have houses alongside the site boundaries. And it's one of the reasons these are rarely put in, in built-up communities. They're usually put more in a more decentralized location. So they do fail. Mostly the problems are minor. Uh, they're a well, well-known and proven technology and, and uh, way of doing business. So they're perfectly acceptable, but you have to manage them. And that's basically what that means. So what's the impact on value in this community? So in the near term, uncertainty is the problem. Um, because people don't know, if, if you try and put yourself in the mind of a house buyer, am I, I can buy here or I can buy in James Bay. 
which of these will I choose? Next to something which I'm not sure about, which might turn into something noisy or obnoxious or which I don't know and I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, well, I'm going to locate in James Bay. So in this community, unfortunately, uncertainty is the killer. What that's going to do is to change the demand for your buildings, uh, whether residential or commercial, and the sales will be slower, and that will eventually turn into value change. In the medium and long term, I think it will be a case of proof. If the thing is built, uh, then people will have a much better idea of whether this is harmful, and the values tend to stabilize. What they'll probably find, though, is that there is a smell, and so the, uh, there will be a reduced demand. Um, the, they're mostly sealed, but maintenance inevitably has some small odors. Uh, sometimes larger, sometimes not even detectable. So in terms of what that will do on your values, probably reduce growth on the real estate and lower dollars. The question was asked of me, what about compensation? Can I be compensated for this? Well, uh, that's a legal decision, but I can perhaps provide some hints. Um, this is not fall due under, in my opinion, under the expropriation compensation uh, uh, position in British Columbia because no land has been acquired. So you have no rights there. But there is something called the tort of Rylands versus Fletcher. Where you've got an escaped danger or escaped problem, the courts have held, it's called tort or tortious liability, and you can sue for compensation for that. And so there could be a class action lawsuit on a tortious liability. If you're CRD, you want to start to think about these things because what that's going to do in CRD is CRD is going to pay the cost of defending against the lawsuits and everybody's going to get angry with one another. The only winners are the lawyers. What's the best practices? So the uh, spider diagram is uh, Hammerby Sjöstad in Sweden, um, where they've done variants on this. It's not exactly this model. Um, the CRD approach has been somewhat different. Uh, the document that you see there on eco to you cities guide is actually the World Bank's document. Uh, they've recommended the, the, uh, the integrated way of doing this. This is not necessarily the CRD way of doing this, but the integrated approach on resource recovery as being international best practices. And I'm pleased to say that uh, there was a study by the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. They looked at what we'd said on this, and they said that this is, as far as they're concerned, best practices, and they quoted it. So the, the model for this being quoted by the World Bank, I think, is good enough exercise to say that, yes, this is, is the right way to go. Is it the right way to go in this location? That's not in the World Bank report. And so I'd, I'd, I'll end up with however you want to deal with the questions, but there's a few pieces up there that you might want to think about. So one of the questions raised is kind of, okay, well, I don't want this here. It, it needs to be somewhere else. What should that be? So that picture up there is of Dockside Green. And if you like that beautiful creek and the nice expensive housing looking over it, that's a nice creek, except that that is actually the sewage treatment plant. So for those of you who have not been down to Dockside Green, the answer is that that is actually the solution. You go with smaller and localized, and although the engineers will say that that increases the cost, in fact, the cost that's actually being paid in actual evidence at Dockside Green is less than the higher end of costs being proposed for the system which CRD is implementing. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that the sewage treatment level proposed by CRD is secondary, which has already been overcome in other areas of the world as, as insufficient. And they've gone to tertiary disinfected, which is what you see at Dockside Green. So when you do that, if you imagine Oak Bay doing this and having a nice creek with plants and uh, walkways alongside it going into Bowker Creek, you could easily do this and add to their community. Now you wouldn't have a pipe going all the way out to Macaulay, McLaughlin, up into your biosolid center. Why? Because it all gets diverted and reused locally. And you avoid all those pumping and treatment and processing costs because they're all done locally. You don't get to that conclusion unless you do a full financial analysis. When you do that analysis, you find out that the environmental results are considerably better. So actually, this region has what the UN itself has designated as one of the most leading edge projects around. And although people like to criticize Dockside Green, this particular plant is actually a very good example of how to get it right. The other do document on the right there is sort of the smoking gun. Surprised the media haven't picked up a little bit on this. 
But what that is, is an agenda where a year ago, um, it's a public document, and that document said uh, 12 months ago, almost exactly, um, that uh, $20,000 should be spent on trying to get a business case to understand what the economics of this should be. Now, right now, my math tells me that they spent nearly $50 million so far, but they don't have a $20,000 business case. Now, so I'm not sure what else is right about this, because in that document, they omit 48% of the debt, and they only look at 13 years of the life cycle. And that document has been there for two years now. So to the best of my knowledge, I think there's some challenges here, if I can put it that way. I could be less restrained, but the media are going to have to leave and we'll turn off the cameras. This is not appropriate. I'm a former government director designated from Treasury Board. This is not appropriate. This is not how the province works. This is not how business works. Sorry to say it, but this is incorrect. And right there is a better solution. So I'm terribly sorry that you're living the experience. I would not have chosen this, and I advocated against it. Thank you.